Welcome everyone to our fifth session of the Mysteries of Eden and looking into this very, very ancient story. It's at least 4,000 years old. The story of the Garden of Eden. Now, the way it's written in the Bible is not 4,000 years old. It might be, but this was written to teach certain lessons. They took this ancient story, the scribe who, who put it in what we call the scriptures, who made it a part of scriptures, is after something here, showing why we get into trouble. If we're God's image and likeness, why do we get into trouble? Well, when we finish with this story, which is the fifth session, when we finish with it, I'll do a little wrap up and we'll take a look at it, okay? So where we left off in the last session is when God was speaking to the serpent. And can you imagine the serpent having a conscience or even consciousness in the sense of, oh yeah, I know what you're saying to me. <laughs> Again, it's a story. So, and even, let me tell you something else. Although I had not gotten into it, I'm going back a little bit on the story. When... Yahweh God said to the earthling, he said, you can eat of all the trees as much as you want, but of that tree of the perception of good and bad, he said, you know, you cannot eat of it because in the day you do eat of it, you will surely die, as most of us quoted, but it's really a death you will die. What did he know about death? He was made from the soil of the earth. All of a sudden, he's breathing because God had put breath into him, into his nostrils, and awakened him. And all of a sudden, now he talks about death. What is death? I wouldn't know what death is. So I said, don't touch it because hmm, the day you do, a death you will die. It wouldn't dawn on me still what he was talking about. A death? What death? I don't know anything about death. I'm, the, I'm a new creature. But... It's like saying to a child, don't go near that fire. You will burn and be sorry. The child doesn't perceive that. You have to bring their hand to the fire so they can begin to feel the heat and sense the danger. That's the first awakening of the perception of good and bad. It's an overall knowledge. So you got to realize that when you're reading this story, that Human beings had to awaken this in them. We could not be like the animals where pain and this and that doesn't show as much in them as it does in us. They feel pain. I'm not saying they don't feel it, but there's no judgment on it. With us, we have judgment because we have something higher in consciousness than they do. So, he's talking to the serpent and... He tells there will be enmity or hostility between human beings and the serpent. All right. So let's continue now. He's finished with the serpent and he turned to the woman. And he says something to the woman. And he's not going to curse her. God did not curse the woman or the man. And when I read it that God cursed human beings, God did not curse. And even with the serpent, I explained that in the last session. He didn't really, he's just saying your state of being will be a curse, which it is. That's how we look as a, at a serpent. But now he turns to the woman and he's not going to curse her. He's going to awaken her to the new status of her body. So he says to her, now to the woman, he said, I will increase your labor. The word pain there means your toil, your labor. You're going to understand all of a sudden now when you're going to have a child, there's going to be pain with it. It's, you're going to feel pain. You know, labor. And your many pregnancies. And with anxiety, you will give birth to children. Because you see, what it's explaining is childbirth. Childbirth, labor's involved, pain is involved with childbirth, but why? 
Not because, and this is not a curse, and this is not a punishment. This is God telling the woman that now this is, you, you, you're going to see now that you're having a child. There's going to be labor pains with it. You're going to have anxiety. You're going to have many pregnancies, and you are going to have children with anxiety. Will the child be normal? Will, and you know, and pregnancy was very dangerous in the ancient world and very precarious. Sometimes even women couldn't become pregnant, and that was a shame in the Near East. They looked at it as if that was a curse on a woman if she could not produce children. And that's why we have even the patriarch's wives, like Abraham's wife, and even uh, Rachel had trouble with childbearing, and all, all the patriarch's wives had trouble in childbearing. So, in other words, there's always anxiety with childbearing, and that's all it's saying. It's just revealing this is what a woman will go through with pregnancy. So, that's all God was saying. Now, this is what's going to happen. You're going to realize that because they didn't have any children. They were already having intimate relations beforehand, but they were still in that child state. They hadn't awakened. Now that they're fully awakened, oh, and now this is going to take place with them. So then he says, with the childbirth, then he says, and toward your husband or your man, you can translate it that way, towards your man, your husband, you will return. Meaning, you will, in order for this pregnancy to take place, in order for this to happen, you've got to return to your man. It can mean turn to your man, return to your man. Which, in other words, you will enact your original state of being with the man. To have children, you will return to the man. This is not a curse. This is a returning to the state of the man where you're one flesh again. You will return to the man, and he will rule over you. Oh, has this one verse in the Bible created so much havoc, so much trouble, and th where women have been villainized and made something awful, and that the man should rule over her because she is an inferior creature. This is not what it's saying. What is saying, he will rule over you in regard to having children. This has to do with the intimacy. You and he he will he will have to take over that to win you over. You need to return to him to become one in flesh again so that you can have children. He will rule over you. The ruling has to do with this particular expression. It has to do with childbearing with intimacy, physical intimacy. This is what it's talking about. Again, it has to do with nature. <laughs> and it follows with the story. And you know what? Even the man is going to have to return to the earth from which he was taken. And we're going to get with that. So everything is returning to its original state. The woman back to the man and then the man will return to his original state, back to the earth. And we're going to get to that now, in a minute. So these are not curses or punishments. They're realization of life kept within the context of the story, the ancient story. So then he turns to the man, then to the earthling, he said. And the reason I used earthling instead of man is because he's going to talk earthy to him. To the earthling, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, here was the real problem. You listened to another voice instead of listening to me. And this is what the writer's telling us. We don't listen to our inner guidance that can keep us out of trouble. 
That's all it's saying. Because you have listened to your wife. And you didn't listen to what I had told you. And you ate from the tree that I commanded you. And I said to you that you will not eat from it. Now what's going to happen? Cursed is the ground because of you. How is the ground cursed? Remember when we read in the beginning of the story? I can give it to you again. Just a little bit is here. When we got to the fifth, the chapter 2, verse 5. Now all the trees of the field were not yet throughout the land. And all the grass of the field had not yet sprouted. Because Yahweh God had not sent down rain upon the surface of the ground. Mm -hmm. So outside of paradise, outside of, it was tougher. Things would be, agriculture would be very, very difficult. Because things hadn't fully sprouted yet, you were going to have to work like a dog. Whereas in paradise... Everything was there. The trees were up. Everything, all you do is keep things clean, keep wild animals out of the garden. You were to do all of that out of this paradise park. All of this, he says, now, curse. In other words, the ground will seem like a curse to you. This is what God is saying. He says, curse it is the ground because of you, because you're going to be put outside. And... With heavy labor. You didn't have this in the garden. You didn't have this in the paradise park. With heavy labor, you will eat of it all the days of your life. And thorns and thistles will it sprout for you. Well, nature makes thorns and thistles sprout. We're talking now very humanly here. And thorns and thistles are done on certain plants and things to protect itself. That's why it's there. It's the same thing with pain for the woman in labor. Because it's the brain, the brain senses what's going on, and the opening of the passage and the movement will create terrible discomfort, some discomfort in opening it. Hmm? So, this is why he's talking about it. But it's not a curse. It's nature. It's nature. And thorns and thistles are nature. It will sprout for you. He's explaining to him what the, he is now going to face. And you will eat of the herb of the field. It's going to be heavy labor. It's going to be with which is the next verse, also in the sweat of your face, you will eat bread. In other words, bread there doesn't mean literally bread there. It means meal. Well, your food. Before you just picked from the trees, you just picked from the ground. Now you're going to work for it very hard. Instead of just keeping things clean, you're going to have to plant. You're going to have to plow. You're going to have to clear. You're going to have to do all this, which is agriculture. It's the birth of agriculture. So now they're learning about it. He says, you will eat. But none of this is a curse. This is an awakening of the awareness of what they would be facing. You will eat bread in the sweat of your face. Because, look what it says. Because from it... You were taken, meaning your nourishment comes from the ground because you were taken from the ground and you need nourishment from the ground. You need plant life. You need these things for your body because that's what your body is made of. Soil you are, and to soil you will return. I know they, they use the word ashes you are and ashes you will return. No, no, no. It's soil you are and it's not dust. It's soil. And there's another scripture that no one, no one ever quotes that belongs in here too. It's in Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter and the 7th verse when it says, Man returns to the soil from which he came, but his spirit returns to God 
from which he also comes. Hmm? It's a double thing here. Spirit returning to spirit and earth returning to earth. So you are, so you would, so man is returning to earth, the woman's returning to the man, but our spirits return to God. Now the man called the name of his wife, Hawa, Hawa. Hawa means life giver, life giver, that's her name, life giver. We always use the word Eve, but it's Hawa. Hava or Hava. You can use a V or a W sound. Hava, life giver. This is the first time we have a name. That's why when we get to the fourth chapter, when it talks about Adam and Eve, we can say Adam, Adam, Adam. And we can say Eve, a name, or Hava, Adam and Hava. because they now have names. And it is the man who names her. Life giver. I love it. Life giver. Because she was the mother of everyone who lives. So, Yahweh God. Now we get, are introduced to something else. If God was angry with them, so-called, I mean, you've got to follow the story. What does God do? Yahweh God made garments of leather. Literally, it says skin, which would be leather, the skin of animals. And made garments, which means he became a tailor. <laughs> He's making garments of leather for the man and the woman. For the man and his wife. So he clothed them. And as I said before, clothing introduces civilization. In other words, we have the full birth of civilization. We have clothing. We have the perception of good and bad. In other words, the whole panoramic view is uncovered here. This is what we face in life. What is the writer telling us? I'll do it in a wrap-up shortly, but let's finish it. So he clothed them. Then Yahweh God said, Look, the man has become like one of us to perceive good and bad. Now perhaps he will stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and will eat and will live forever. Therefore, Yahweh God sent him from the paradise park of Eden. Now, here's something. To work the ground from the very place that he was taken. In other words, where he was formed, that very ground where he was formed, where God breathed, blew the breath of life into his nostrils, he's going to work that very place outside the park, outside paradise. So Yahweh God expelled him. And then he stationed east of the garden paradise of Eden, always in the east, a krowa. In Hebrew, it's karobim. Karubim, karubim means two guardians, two guardians. And in the ancient world, the guardians, they had wings. And they, even in the temples of, of, in Babylon that we've dug up, and I, they showed the, the, two, the two bulls with the head of a man, which means intellect. <laughs> they are guards. And the winged, the winged bull which means they represent something celestial. They believed that the gods and goddesses watched over their palaces, and they made these symbols as representations of the god and goddesses. And in the book of Ezekiel, we have the same symbol of the kerubim, or the 
karobe, which we translate as cherubs. <laughs> when we say cherubs, we think of those cute little babies with those little arrows, and we think of love, but here it means the full grown beings, sometimes animals with a man's head, sometimes reversed, a full human body with an animal head or an eagle head. And then there are sometimes the karubim as fully human body, human head, but with wings. The wings denote omnipresence, to be everywhere. This is all symbolism, which means the tree of life is always guarded. Always guarded, which means the precious life in our nervous system and in the spinal column, which goes out into all the organs, which are the fruits of life. Hmm? They're the fruits. And our lungs all work with the entire nervous system. The whole body is a living paradise. It is. But we don't bother to take care of it. We do whatever we want with it. And we get into trouble. And in fact, the scriptures talk about, he that overcomes will I grant to eat of the tree of life. In other words, overcoming all the challenges we meet in life. Hmm? If you meet them properly, with not the voice of all the people and telling you what to do, but that inner, inner voice that's pure, that has clear, that sees beyond borders and all the things that we have erected in the name of truth and in the name of a political pol policy or in the name of a religion, all these lines, we can transcend them. In fact, that is the only way we will have peace on earth. I must transcend all the borders and lines and divisions that have, I have created, that I have projected outwardly, that I have created through philosophy. You see, what most people don't realize is the Bible wasn't what we call a religion. They didn't even have the word religion. They used the word path, something you could walk upon, meaning a philosophy of life. And this whole story is a philosophy of life to awaken us to, all right, we do suffer because we have this tree of life, because we have this tree of the perception of good and bad. Okay, what will we follow? Will we follow what we call God? You know, God is just a term to describe something that we don't know anything about. Some people liken it to consciousness and awareness. It's life itself. We call God love. We call God peace. We call God joy. We call God consciousness. We call God because God is not a person. God is something that is beyond human reasoning. It's beyond it. There's something about us that's so fantastic that we don't even know. Honestly and truly, there is no death. Consciousness never dies because consciousness was never born. But we are born into a world, the physical. And I don't have time to go into all of that. But just to give you an idea... It is this state of being. What is, we say, what is God? I got news for you. What is a human being? We're still discovering, and I love it, that we don't have the answers to everything. No one, no one has the answers to everything. We only have partial answers. We only have, and the partial answer creates even more questions. But we're here, I love it to continue to discover and expand in consciousness and awareness that we may live a joyful, happy life instead of the one we create when we follow the true inner sense of God. 
As I told you, the human family is like the human body. The human body is never no separation. The human body only differentiates itself into different forms, but it's always, you know what individual means? Undivided. And individual means undivided. But my body, body turns into a finger, a nose, eyes, ears, all kinds of things. It is indivisible. It's the same thing with the human family. We always think of it as separation. It is not separation. What it is is differentiation. The human family has differentiated into color, into different shapes, into the slant of the eyes, into all kinds of things like the human body. It differentiates itself so that different functions can take place. It's the same thing with the human family. We are not separate. We have differentiated and not divided. We are one. Now, let your inner mind and your subconscious be swept clean of all the negativity we've had about the story of the Garden of Eden.